am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so as Pradeep rightly said that it's on. So we are going to share experiences. Normally, talks are about experiences that you you actually have in your past. So we want to see as this quite an outcome of the experiences that me and Deepak have always had in the in the past projects that we've worked on. Uh, extensively, all the UI developers face some kind of people are working on CSS face such issues always. And we want you to not face it again in the future. So we're going to give you some quite insight of the bones that we have faced, the problems we have faced, the good parts as well. Not to leave that up, leave that aside. Um, so yeah, let's get started with that. Right, can you use mic? I think it will be difficult for the guy to I'm not audible, that's it. It's gonna be a bit of thing on the phone. I think it will be better if you don't mind. Better now? Yeah. Great. So, uh, okay. So we want to CSS, as I said, as part of some of the experiences and the ones we've faced in the past. Uh, I should quickly tell you about who this talk is for. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting that each one of you has worked in CSS in the past, or maybe frameworks, or is quite actively working on CSS right now, because. Uh, we are not really going to talk about how to learn CSS or not, not about the properties or the difference between a float or a XLN right or border and nothing. So I'm expecting you all know CSS. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, moving forward, um, takeaway. So if I, when I say takeaway, it's always going to be what I'm going to learn from this session. I, I'm hoping that you all are expecting some of the other things from this session. So, I'm going to help you all understand the basic convention problems that people face. Uh, you being the CSS guy, you you normally do some mistakes that we give you. And at the end of the day, it's your problem that comes after some time. So, you're going to learn how to use basic conventions that are popular in the market right now. We're going to share the conventions and practice that we have done in the past and might be helpful for you in the coming future as well. Um, what is this talk about and it is not, I'm not going to teach you any framework or CSS, property, anything. We are just going to talk about the conventions, practices, and ways you can achieve the readability, the usability, the maintainability of your CSS code. That's all. Yep. Uh, before we dive into the deeper parts of CSS, let me take you through the evolution of CSS or HTML. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, this one. Uh, let's get restarted. Now, why I say let's get restarted is because you all know CSS, right? And very silly things and small mistakes that you do in your regular code is something you avoid, you ignore on a daily basis. Uh, why I say this is, I myself do that. So, if I have to do something, if I have to fix something, I just use a hacky code and get done with it. I want to, I want to deliver something at the end of the day. I need to get it done. But if at the first place I would have, I would have done it properly, <coughs> I did not have to use any hacky code right now. So that is what it is. So I'm going to help you all understand it from the right start. If you do it correctly, you should not be doing any hacky code in the near future. Or someone else who replaces you on the project should not be you know, doing that hacky code job, you know, getting in trouble or fixing something that he has to fix. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, evolution of HTML CSS. Um, quick description, quick, quick uh, intro for this. Um, back in 1990s, uh, sharing documents was a very popular thing on the internet. That was the only thing people could do with the internet, actually. So there was this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, who was a research guy, and he wanted to share his document, always. So they, all the researchers did that. But he wanted to not only share his document, but also be easy to access the things within the document, the references given within the document. So he would wanted something that would let people access the connected documents. That's what he wanted. So that gave birth to the hypertext. So he was able to embed a link within the document, which was not really available before that. So that gave birth to HTML, which was based on HTML. Uh, so after that happened, that took a lot of popularity. and. Uh, Web developer community you know, took quite an interest. 
things changed drastically within four five years a lot of versions of HTML came out. Uh, the primary thing that HTML did was format your page. So if you know that your Word document has a lot of features in which you can format your document, you can color your text, you can add images, you can give hyperlink as well, yes. and not to forget you can add tables and everything in charts. But that that feature they wanted in the document that could be shared with other people as well. The document was not easily available to share. You cannot just share your Word doc, you have to upload it to an email, and that's a tedious task. But they wanted this to be done easily and accessible to everyone. So with the increasing, with each iteration of HTML version, tags were added, the formatting was done, that was made easier. Things were able, people were able to do it very easily. Uh, but there came a point, they felt that there was a need that things had to change. That change was very important. That was revolutionary, that was CSS. Around 1996, when HTML 3.2 was launched, there was the CSS and JavaScript that was introduced. JavaScript introduced behavioral patterns in the, in the, in the web pages that we use today. Uh, if, we, if I take it furthermore, so now we have HTML5 and CSS3. It took like two decades for them to bring something very revolutionary that was CSS3 and HTML5. If you're actively working on CSS3, you know what changes are there in CSS2 and CSS3, right? So CSS3 has given a very big shape shift within the web world. Uh, if you're web 2.0 and web websites now, there's a, there's a drastic change, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, I've used my glasses. Um, just to give a quick view, this is the screenshot of Yahoo in 1996 and Amazon in 2005. I don't know if anyone has seen this before. So it's very, very basic. But at that point of time, this was a revolution. That was the cutting edge. People could have this much only. That was the biggest thing to have. So if I would go back then, I was in school. Not to forget, I was in school. I, could not, I did not know this existed at all. Uh, so. Things were very simple, but people wanted something more fancier. There is some point of time when you get saturated, you want something new to come in. Uh, there was a point when HTML was given a limitation. They wanted something new. They wanted to add something. Uh, also, HTML has some. So, as I said, I, I've been narrating good things about HTML, right? HTML also has a bad side of it at that point of time. So what 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 happened was. Uh, So back, what happened actually was, uh, if you can assume yourself in 1994-95, what was HTML, what was your web page like, what was this, right? What you could do was you can add presentation tags, that was font tags, bold tags, marquee tags, and everything. That would be only formatted to your page. But each time you added a tag, your page size would increase. You would, you would, be, you would have redundant code. Plus, if you had multiple pages, it was difficult to access, access it and make changes. That was a trouble. So, what did the web developer community think was, let's bring something, let's change something. So, what was the problem? This was the problem, that you had redundancy, you had optimization problem, you had accessible problem. So, they brought in CSS. What did CSS do? CSS did this. CSS did this to us. It changed everything. It, it just brought about a drastic change throughout. You could do things. You could add colors. You can do in a very optimal and quick manner. So, you, so I've been dragging about CSS now. Uh, what is CSS? What exactly it is? So back then, uh, when I said the multiple codes, redundant codes, things had to change. So what they did was they, uh, they to give you one more example or one more reference. Um, Assume at that point of time, do you know there were internet connections in 1994s, 95s? What were they? Dial up. Exactly. So when I say dial up connection, do you know the speed of a dial up connection? At most? Yeah, 30 kbps at most. So consider this HTML page that I showed up of the Yahoo. What would the size of that page be? 5 kb, 6 kb, 4 5 kb? Assume loading a 5 kb page on a 20. 20 kbps internet connection, how would you feel? You just, 
your patient goes off. You have to have patience, right? So this was one of the major concerns. No one would want to wait so much. No one wants such crappy site to take so much of time and does not give anything. So when CSS came in, things changed. What changed? Uh, so what changed? So CSS got, so what happened is CSS was the presentation layer. So at that point, all the tags that I said, the bold tag, the italic tag, the font tag, everything was presentation only. They did not really serve purpose to the structure of the page. They did not help in the layout of the page at all. And the primary concern of HTML page coming into existence was the structure. If it did not serve the purpose structure, there is no use of that tag. That was simple concern and simple understanding until HTML 5.0. That's what I understand as well. So what happened is, the, you simply separate the concern of the structure and the presentation. So, so that's what they did. They moved out CSS completely. They bought a separate layer of presentation, a separate layer of structure, a separate layer of behavior. That was JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and one. And things changed there on. So that's what I said. The structure and presentation layers got separated. It was easier to code. It was the pages were optimized. They were faster. They were easy to change. Things you could do very easily, swiftly, and saved a lot of time. Yeah, internet got faster, but still, there was a concern of speed. But internet was pretty fast, but page size did not grow drastically. It grew a bit. So if I have to say that if the Yahoo page was there at that point of time, it was 5 kbps with 20 kbps in that connection. It was 10 kbps, 10 kb page with 100 kbps connection. Quite a difference, right? It is faster. So good things about CSS, and I will quickly try to do this. That's what I said. Speed of design development. Things became faster, quick. People were able to quickly design their pages, develop their pages, do changes, manipulate it the way they wanted. Things changed drastically. There was consistency throughout the page with the design. So, if you're a UI developer, you're a designer, you're a developer, you know the consistency. Pages are same. You do not repeat the code, you just reuse the CSS, it works for you. Ease of use, multiple browser support. So, one of the important parts of multi browser support is uh, not all browsers have had the support with the same, uh, would not support the same property. So, what the WTC did is they started recommending some properties. If all the browsers and people started using it, it would become a property for the next version, otherwise, it would go off. It will stay in the draft or go off. So, how far have we come? What, is, what are we now? So, as I said, CSS3 brought a big time change in our web community, web world, everything. It just evolved, it grew out. It was the big thing. So, does anyone recognize this? No one does. That's, that's a bit of a shock for me as well. Um, CSS3 was launched around 2009. Twitter had this page in 2010 itself, and this was a viral thing on the web. This is the first ever CSS3 animated complete page. Yep. This complete CSS3, trust me. So CSS3 animation was a big thing. People still use it, they love it. I wouldn't deny that. Pseudo selectors, a big other than drastic big change in CSS3. So you could simply select any number of so you know childs, right? So within an element you have to select X some X child and Make some apply some properties or classes, you could simply do that with it. Background gradients. I remember doing something for background gradients. So I don't know if you remember, but <coughs> web two point there, there was a passion, there was a fashion of having gradiented buttons. What would you do? You have two slices of edges and one slice of background being repeated completely. Um, that was a bad thing, I realize now. But those were required at that point of time. So it was a good thing, but they, they thought that it was acquired, things had to change, they bought this background gradient. Web fonts, again, another big thing. I love this, I love web fonts. Uh, I don't know if I've tried it or not. So, you can simply embed your own font into the page, uh, provided it is a web, web font and OTF font. Then it works, otherwise it would not work. Uh, because it's again, multi browser support, some browsers do not support some particular type of font. You need to provide that as well. Oh, media queries. One big revolution again. So, what is media query? I, I, everyone knows that. What's media query? Supporting multiple devices. Uh, have you heard the word responsive? Yeah. Everyone knows that. That works on media query. 
one side works on all devices, responsive media. That works on media queries. Media query is nothing but based on the size of the browser, the site will change its thing based on CSS only, not JavaScript. Do you want to size the browser? So one CSS, things work for me. You can see the menu has changed, things have stacked up, nothing is chopping off. Previously, I had to have two different port bases, two different websites for mobile and desktop. Things were that hard. Obsession. It's obsessed to responsive stuff. We'll do it for Great. And much more things. Border radius, box shadows, flex box, name it, you have it. Things have drastically changed. And, and I love I love it. So CSS3 has been Quite a new thing for me, and I'm still I'm still learning. It's it's never a nice thing for me. Okay, so I would like to. So I've been bragging good things about CSS. I would give it to Deepak to now criticize a bit now. You gonna take it? Yep. Thank you, Raj. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, I like to talk about uh, <coughs> Hello. So, Rahi, let's talk about how awesome CSS is and what can we do with CSS. Uh, I will. I would like to talk about what are the problems that we face in our UI development. What are the problems with CSS? So first thing is that CSS is very very old. So CSS came into existence in 1996, which makes it like 20 years old now. So if you compare it with other languages like JavaScript or Java. So these languages have evolved over time and are more suited for, to handle the technical task that we face now. Uh, also the versions, if you uh, compare the versions, so Java came, first version of Java came in 1996 and in 2014 we have got like Java 8 and in CSS3 we have, uh, in CSS we have got only three versions and the last version came in like five, six years ago. So CSS is actually not suited that much for today's task. It is not evolved that much over time. Uh, it works on global namespace. So CSS operates globally. So it's leaky by nature. Uh, so if you compare it with other languages, so things in other languages can be encapsulated very well, right? But in CSS, it's, <coughs> it's a bit difficult task to do. So it's inherently, uh, it's very, very loose. So CSS is very easy to learn and understand. I think if you spend like a couple of hours, you'll be able to make a website of your own. Right? But, uh, but it's very easy to do a bad job in CSS. Because it doesn't give you any errors or warnings, it doesn't even give a syntax error that what went wrong, right? So it's very easy, but it's very easy to do a bad job. Inheritance. So it's the fundamental concept of CSS. So it's actually a very good thing for identify CSS. So if you want to repeat some of the properties throughout your page, you can just define it in your body or HTML tag like font family or font, and you can just use it throughout the page, right? But as the web developers, we all know when an element has inherent dependencies, it may cause a lot of problem when you Auto matters, this is procedural, right? So any, any element which is defined later in the style sheet will have precedence over the former element. Uh, and the last and then top of all of it is specificity. So how many of you guys know what specificity is? 
Anyone? Do you know what specific precedence like class and ID? Yeah. Uh, do you know what cascade in CSS? What does cascade look like in CSS? Okay. Uh, so cascade is okay. so cascade is a mechanism by which uh, whenever there is a collision between two properties or two selectors, so cascade decides which selector to <coughs> apply for that particular element. Uh, cascade does it by using specificity. So specificity tells us how specific a particular selector is. Uh, I can I can. Can I have a marker? I will try to explain it. So, so CSS has given some predefined weightage to all the selectors that we have. Uh, so, any element, any tag has the least specificity. So, it has a least specificity of one. Then a class will always override an element. Sorry. So it has a specificity of 10. And ID will always override a class. Okay, so ID has the highest specificity. So a class will override an element, and an ID will override a class. Okay? Uh, so there used to be a way where we can uh, we can use combination of IDs to override a class, and it literally uh, takes 256 classes in a combination to override an ID. Right? Uh, but Chrome took it as a bug because uh, if you consider, uh, let me give you an example. So how many uh, how many unique class can we have on one page? Can anyone answer that? N number, of n number of classes, right? It, it's like infinite. You can use as many classes as you want. How many unique IDs can we have on one page? So if you talk, uh, you can have a multiple elements the same ID, but if you require to uh, like, uh, get this from Java, so we will get the first one. Yes. So, so we can have actually have only one ID mm -hmm. for one page, right? So ID is like infinite times more specific than a class. So uh, ID should always be overriding the class, right? So that is what happens now. So, uh, so actually, specificity gives uh, so much power in the hand of a developer that it becomes very easy to to do a bad job while using specificity. So I have seen in projects that uh, specificity wars going on in projects when. Uh, if you want to use a particular component, and uh, you, you want to make some changes to it, and you want to override it, and instead of increasing its specificity by class, appending class, we will try to use IDs, right, which give it much higher specificity. Now, if some other developer comes in and tries to modify that class, he can that element, he cannot do it. Right, because now we are using an ID. So what he needs to do is to add another ID to it to make it more specific. And then the previous one comes and he adds one more ID to it to make it more even more specific, right? And then at last somebody will come and add bang important tag to it to make it just like at the top of everything. But what does it it, it creates a lot of mid table issues, right? Uh, so these are the problems that we uh, see in our day-to-day -day UI development, and these are the problems that we need to overcome. I think, and so there are so many things available in market. We have we have many frameworks, different frameworks. We have some methodologies. Uh, I would like to take some time to discuss about frameworks. Uh, very can you please change the slide? Okay, uh, I'm sorry I missed this one. So where does it leave us? So this is old, loose, globally operating, 
inheritance based language which is entirely based on source order, except when you introduce its own best feature specificity. But it's not that bad. It looks very bad thing, very bad definition for something, but it's not that bad. Uh, we can over we can tackle these problems, we can over this, overcome these problems as well. Yeah, so let's talk about frameworks. So how many of you have used any framework before? Any CSS framework? So which framework did you use? Bootstrap. Awesome. So what were your experiences with Bootstrap? It's quick and easy to use. Yeah. Any other? What framework did you use? Bootstrap. Everybody loves Bootstrap. Sometimes material UI. Okay. So uh, I have seen that people have very strong opinions regarding the choice of framework or whether we should use framework or not. Uh, some I have seen in developer community that people are some people are totally against using framework. They say it's bad. It, it does a lot of issues, and some are very keen to use frameworks because of its good development and easy user. Uh, so I wanted to have a critical and objective opinion about the use of frameworks. Uh, yeah, anything just like okay, let's look at the definition what a framework actually is. So a frame so the definition says a basic structure underlying a system concept or text. So a framework should be like a school of thoughts, right? It's a way how you approach things, right? It's a way how you do, how you solve your problems. Let's talk about some of the advantages of CSS. Oh, sorry, frameworks. So it's very easy to develop, right? It's everything is there, everything is pre-cooked for you. You just have to go plug and play, and this your start, your website starts working. Cross browser support. They have already done everything for you, right? Uh, you don't even need to care about. Uh, the hacks, how all it will run on i7 or i8 or, or the older versions. Very structured, modular, so they provide predefined components. If you want to use the accordion, you want to use a message box, or you want to use a header, anything. Everything is there. You can just go and copy the STM CSS or just apply the CSS classes, helper classes provided by them, and it will work. Help beginners learn. So yeah, if you are a beginner and you want to start with CSS, I think using a framework is a good idea. Uh, so with advantages, let's talk about some of the disadvantages, some of the problems that comes with frameworks. Okay, so bulky. So most of the CSS framework that I have seen are bloated. So there is more than what you actually want from that. Uh, so I, as a web developer, have a have a practice of not having any extra lines of code in my CSS files. And getting rid of these extra lines, extra things is really a overkill for me. So I think bulky is a problem. Too much descriptive. So they are too much opinionated. They will tell you everything. This is how your button should look like. This is how your button should look like. This is how your burger packet will look like. This is how your buttons will be blue. Your alert messages will be red. So they, they give too much, they are too much prescriptive about how, how your component should look like. I think this should not be the case. They limit us. 
So they try to force their design design decisions on you. Uh, so they have a internal way of doing things. Like I have seen that most of the frameworks follow grid system, right? Along with some components and some helper helper classes. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, so when flexbox properties came in, so uh, do you guys know what flexbox is? Yes. So when flexbox properties came, it, 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 it is awesome, right? So it works very well. So with flexbox, you can just give one property, say display flexbox uh, to a container, and all the child of that container will automatically shrink or expand its width according to the size of the page, right? So I wanted to use it. Also, if you are adding dynamic containers to some page, I think Flexbox is a very good option. But if you are using Bootstrap or any other framework which follows grid system, I think it's it's a bit hard to implement and it limits me to achieve what I want to do. Slow learning curve in terms of CSS, uh, I think people depend too much on frameworks. Uh, they just learn the helper classes and they don't want to go in the internals of CSS or the underlying concepts or even the underlying concepts of that framework. Uh, so it becomes a bit hard when you are doing some custom development over it and causes maintainability problems. Okay. I think it's, it, it, it depends on you, what choice you make, if you want to go with a framework or you want to go with some methodologies that are available in market. Frameworks uh, does solve your problem and they are very good, they are very uh, good candidate if you want a quick development, but if you, if you are looking at writing uh, clean and follow some of the best practices that are in the market. So my opinion will be uh, to go with some of these methodologies rather than frameworks. So I wanted to talk about object oriented CSS plus SMAX plus BBM. So SMAX stands for systematic model. Sorry. Scalable and modular architecture for CSS and VM stacks for block element and modifier. So, yeah, so let's continue with object oriented CSS. So, object oriented CSS is a way of writing CSS that avoids duplicating code by separating the styles into layered abstraction. So, basic principle or basic idea behind object oriented CSS is to identify modules or modules or design patterns in your code, right? And try to reuse those design patterns instead of reusing the whole component, whole complete component. So object oriented CSS helps in creating uh, reusable components which can which we can move across projects or across pages. Uh, so does anyone know who Nicole Sullivan is? Okay. So she is like a celebrity in web world. Uh, so in nine in 2009, I guess, okay. uh, when she was working with Facebook uh, as a CSS developer, so she was looking at the she was looking at the first page, uh, the home page of Facebook, and and she identified that there is a very similar pattern which is repeated all across the page. So if you see this, you will see image on the left and content on the right, right? If you see the comment box, you'll see image on the left and content on the right. Within the comments, you'll see image on the left and content on the right. 
in that ad section also. So same pattern is repeated over and over again, but with some different skin, right? So uh, the styling is a bit different, but the underlying the structure is the same. So she identified it and she extracted it out, uh, something like this. She called it media object. So a media object has uh, just the structure and then media dash body, which is the body of that media part and the image which is on the left. If she wanted to reverse the image, she would have the image coming right side. So she created other classes like this. This is the HTML for that media attribute, which is I think pretty simple. So object oriented CSS is all about identifying your module and then make it reusable so that we can uh, move it across the projects. So it works on very simple, two very simple rules. Uh, first is <coughs> separation of container from content and second is separation of structure from the screen. So our content or our module should never depend upon its container. Uh, we should never namespace our module or our class with your container. I'll explain it with an example. So suppose we have this comment box and which is inside this block which is the primary column. Uh, so if you wanted to write it CSS we can write it like this, that primary column and inside it is a comment box which has some of the properties, right? And this will work for this column. This will work very well. But suppose there is a scenario when we have to use this comment box in this secondary column as well. So if we will copy this in the secondary column, it will break. Why it will break? Because it depends, this class depends upon its parent, right? So if this name is space with the parent, which we don't want. This is what we wanted to separate out. So if we separate this comment box, this module from its parent, it will become reusable. And now we can use it. We can use it in secondary column or in primary column, or we can just take it out and use it in across in some other project or other place. So this is what we call as separation of content from its container. Okay. Uh, second property is separation of structure from the skin. So, so I will explain it with, with another example. Suppose we have this comment box and this is the HTML for this comment box. So it simply says an image, right? And a span which contains some text. This is fine, but uh, okay. So here is it CSS. We have this comment box, its background is white, padding is 20 pixel, border radius is 20 pixel. Then we have comment box image, which has some properties to align it on the left. We have this comment box body, which has some properties to align it on the right, right? Now suppose we have a requirement to have another comment box which is of different background, which is of orange color background, right? So our designer asked us to create some feature box. So now what we do? We cannot use this comment box because we have this property in it. Either we override this property or we, can, we need to create another class for that. So suppose we have created another class now we are calling it comment box feature, uh, which has background orange, padding 20, border radius 20 pixel. Right. So what separation of skin from a container says, from its structure says, that we should extract out the structural bit from our components. Right. So, so what we are doing here is we have separated the structural bit like padding and border radius and we are calling it comment box. We have separated the skin for the theming properties and we are calling it comment box common which is background white. 
and comment box featured, which has been done orange. Now we can use the combination of these two to achieve this, and we can use the combination of these two to achieve orange box. Right? So this is what we call as separation of skin from its structure. So if we are following these simple small principles, we can make reusable components which can be moved across projects and which which can save you a lot of efforts, right? Okay, so that's it. Uh, I'll pass it on to Rahim for his plans. What do you recommend to all CSS, each sales for it, for CSS, separate, separate file are in uh, So that is exactly what he is going to talk about. Right? To answer your question, it's very simple. It's your personal choice. What I've been showing here is basically the principle, the practice, or a convention. It is not that you have to do it, it's that if you follow this, you might fall in, not fall into trouble in the future. It's saving your own trouble. It's simply that. If you follow it, hitting the pain now, you do that. Okay. So, um, my colleague says that we take a two minute break. Is that okay or do you want to continue? So, we can take a break for two minutes? Yeah.